some uh, contact information about uh, how to uh, track me down afterward. That'll also be on the last slide. I will eventually put the slides somewhere up online for you to peruse at your own uh, whatever. I know there is a uh, very strict uh, no, uh, no camera policy. Uh, uh, it makes total sense in a city that's, well, I mean, there's like next door is a Russian consulate building. The presidents all do the uh, White House correspondence. Well, most of the presidents do the White House correspondence dinner here. Uh, so just uh, remember that there's tons and tons and tons of cameras focused on us all the time because there's spy stuff going on all the time. But uh, whatever you do, don't take pictures of, uh, of each other. That would be bad. Actually, if anyone wants to take pictures, I'm in frame so that feel free. I don't give a shit. All right? There we go. I'm done with my uh, rant on photos. I, I actually do that every time I speak at Shmukhan. All right, this is the minimal background you're going to get uh, for this talk, which is uh, I am a researcher for the GitLab security team. I work on multiple projects. The main one I've been working on is Zero Trust, uh, but that ends up touching a whole lot of odd things, so it seems like I work on some other odd projects when a lot of times they're all basically still related to or caused by what we're doing with Zero Trust, so I get to head down interesting paths. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the main, the main one I'm working on right now, uh, and that's the one I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, I am not going to have any of those zero trust charts or diagrams, uh, particularly that one from, uh, Beyond Corp, uh, because that's, uh, really, really important if you're, uh, uh an employee at Google. All right, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, put that one up. Doesn't make any sense to do that. Uh, also, the stuff that I'm I'm not gonna put up one for us because it doesn't apply to you guys. Okay, this is what GitLab is doing for its employees, and so it's biased towards our environment. What works for us may not work for you. The whole point of this is that I'm just gonna tell you how we're doing with what we're doing and then maybe the examples of the problem solving and the issues that we come up with will get you guys thinking about stuff. Anyway, so first off, we're gonna tr I'm gonna give you what we view as the definition of zero trust. Your view may differ from ours. So roughly, what we wanna do is we wanna be able to positively identify each user. We know that the user is who they say they are. We want to positively identify each device so we know, hey, that device is in good shape. We, we trust it. And we want to uh, rank data according to sensitivity. And then we want to make sure that we uh, uh, store data securely on systems and in databases uh, with uh, some uh, granular access control and then use uh, some uh, policies to define the access to the data by these users using these devices. That's roughly it. It does touch into some other areas and we'll get into that, but that's roughly what most people think of it as and that's what we think of it as. All right, everyone keeps uh, talking about uh, ZTN within the industry. Uh, every vendor seems to have a different opinion on what it actually is. It usually has something to do with whatever is in their product line. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, I know. If, if they had something that they've been selling for 10, 15 years, and then all of a sudden Zero Trust came out, it's instantly a Zero Trust solution. They just rebrand it and add a couple of features and say, hey, we do Zero Trust now. So, and, and we're, oh, and we're a complete solution. And they all refer to the same Beyond Corp model as, yeah, this is what we're doing, uh, which is uh, interesting. But the thing is, it's like there's no vendor that actually has a complete 
solution for any of this. This will become very apparent as we get further into this talk because I'm going to go into some uh, detail into some certain areas that just vendors don't do that. So basically, this is it. You know, it's a vendor that isn't Google trying to sell an incomplete version of an internal Google solution to my company. So it's not going to work at all. Not the way they say it is. So, to kind of give you a little bit of scope here, most vendors, when they do this stuff, they kind of go after uh, the, they have a kind of a rule where they kind of go where they think you're kind of uh, at as a company. and say, okay, well, he's here, we're going to guide him to there, and, and we're going to do this whole zero trust thing. And one of the things they focus on, they say, well, okay, you're going to be having to remove your perimeter because there's no perimeter when it comes to zero trust. Uh, you're going to have to dismantle that VPN that you've had all this time because that's a part of your perimeter. That's got to go away. Uh, you're going to have to deal with those remote workers, even though they were, you know, before they were, you know, had to go through that VPN. You're going to have to figure out a way to handle them. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that you've got some stuff that's in the cloud, some stuff is on-prem, and uh, so it's going to be kind of difficult for you. And uh, we're going to be doing things like leveraging your existing uh, uh, asset management uh, because we all know that you have 100% and complete control of all your users' devices. So we're going to help you with that. Uh, and this and everything is going to work fine. Don't worry. Now. The problem is that is not what reality is, okay? Uh, especially for us. The reality here is that we do not have, uh, we have no perimeter at GitLab. We never did. We, uh, we never will, okay? Uh, as a result, we also don't have a VPN. We've never had one and we never, we never will. Uh, we have all remote workers, okay? If you look up the address and go to headquarters, I think it's like a UPS store or something. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not. That's a, that's actually. I'm not kidding. I think that's where you end up. Uh, people are disappointed, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. We do have a uh, yeah one resident boardroom, uh, but but I mean it's just you know this we don't we're 100 percent remote company. Okay, and uh, or if you want to get technical, I guess you could say as of last Monday, we're a company with 1,164 branch offices <laughs> in in uh, 66 countries. Uh, that that's how many, roughly how many employees we have. Uh, I know that when I started last February, at the end of last February, uh, so I've been. Uh, GitLab almost a year. We were at like 350, 400 around there, and now we're uh, we'll be by the end of the month easily 1,200. So we're just like growing like crazy. Um, oh, and the other thing is that uh, we are all cloud. We've always been cloud, so there's no on-prem. Uh, we're using no less than four cloud providers at this moment. So we're we're in uh, GCP, AWS, Azure, and DigitalOcean. I believe that's the uh, the four. Hopefully, there's not a fifth one that's popped up since I left on Friday to come here, or left on Thursday to come here. Um, but that, and we, there's always talk of we're going to reduce that down, and it it, it hasn't quite happened. Uh, we have 100 plus SaaS applications that we're dealing with. And I say 100 plus because that was as of about, I think the last time I checked the number is about two weeks ago and someone says we're at 101 and we got some more on eval. So uh, it just keeps happening. Uh, as far as asset management goes, this one's uh, gonna be rather shocking to you. We only started buying employee laptops a couple of years ago. Before that, it was BYOD, people. That's right. The whole company's running on their own hardware. The only rule we had was no Windows. Um, and so this is why we cannot rely 
on any single vendor because there's no one that covers just that. We can get close with some, but they don't cover everything. And I haven't covered all the issues that we uh, uh, currently uh, face as. We do have some pain points. Um, uh, data classification. The, what we want to do is we want to, uh, okay, now this is, how should I best describe this? It's fluid, and it's in, in a way that when you log in in the morning, data may be classified one way, and by mid-afternoon, it could be classified another way, okay? Because that's the nature of how things end up working. To give you, uh, just, I'll give you a real simple example of a real-world thing that happened. We had uh, a security problem that was reported to us by a customer, and they said, it looks like uh, some bad guy can come in and see all, well, basically someone unprivileged can see privileged information. That's bad, right? And so we said, and our classification scale was red, orange, yellow, and green, with green being public and red being uh, bad, okay? Affecting multiple companies or affecting all employees or what, however, the, however we had, whatever we applying the data to. Uh, this would be considered orange. It affected one customer and just like, okay, this is bad. Uh, we started looking at it and it was worse than what the customer had uh, explained it to us. Once we did some investigation, it affected all customers or at least a good chunk of them. And so it instantly became red data. At that point, we worked through, got a fix, got the fixed uh, pushed out to customers, and then, of course, since we're open core, uh, pushed out all the uh, code changes to everyone so everyone could pretty much see what we did to fix it. Uh, and we actually published out stuff and said, here's what happened, here's what we've done, here's what we've done to try to mitigate this from happening in other areas, et cetera. The data becomes public or green data. However, the customer said, we don't want our name associated with it, so the fact that that particular customer reported it is yellow data, which is internal only, okay? Now, someone, that's a very simplified example of data, okay? Moving from system to system and its various points has changed classification. This can happen in other realms and areas as well, obviously, but what happens is, is if I have someone that authenticates in in the morning while it's still red and by mid-afternoon it's green and yellow, do I need to have that person log out and back in to reestablish creds and, you know, and, and because they were using tokens to access this or that or whatever? You know, that's not something that uh, uh, a, a lot of, like say, an authentication vendor would be able to support. They don't know anything about that kind of stuff. And so those are, that's a very simplified explanation of the type of problem I'm talking about when we're talking about uh, data classification, that is fluid, and so that becomes a pain point. It also becomes a pain point uh, when, because we had to have, like I said, we got these data classifications. We also had to come up with data zones because we might, let's say we had some type of database where it was either you had access to it or you didn't have access to it because it was some, you know, a piece of uh, shit database that didn't work very well. And that's all you got. You just got, you can get to it or you can't. In that case, you had to say, well, if red data ends up in there, that's a red zone. Even though we may put orange or yellow or even green data in there, it doesn't matter you have to have credentials to access red data before you can get to anything in this because it contains red data, all right? We have that there. It's not used very often. I'd like to eliminate it completely that we don't have data zones, but it exists as a concept to at least capture uh, if that happens. Uh, this is another one, uh, provisioning and deprovisioning of uh, new employees or ex-employees or whatever the case may be is hard to do, particularly when you have 100 plus SaaS systems and based upon what their job description is, they may need access to 
I don't know, half of them, a third of them, you know, half of the systems that exist in the company internally. Uh, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to manage that uh, and to be able to control that and do it effectively. So we had that as a, a pain point. And since you're creating users and building this whole zero trust thing, this becomes a provisioning and deprovisioning becomes a big important part of that. I'll talk about how we fix that later on. Um, and like I mentioned, we barely have uh, uh, end user asset management. We're, we're okay on our, you know, our servers, our containers, our instances, all that kind of stuff. We've got kind of a handle on that, but, uh, uh, you know, end user devices, that's, uh, that, that's kind of an ugly, uh, kind of an ugly thing, a work in progress. Um, um, uh, managing uh, processes, demons, runners, wh whatever you want to call it, just managing these things, uh, they're not tied to into user identity like we'd like in all cases. And because sometimes you do want that, you know, what, what user created whatever thing that generates this process that has higher privileges goes out and does stuff. If that person changes jobs or leaves the company, do I need to change who's assigned to this? Do I need to go through and uh, actually uh, expire all the associated tokens? You know, how do I handle that process? Do, is it even needed, for example? You know, so just tracking that is kind of a... Uh, kind of a, a, a rough thing for us. So roughly what our plan is, is instead of focusing on zero trust, we kind of do ZTN-ish, if that makes, it doesn't make sense, but that's what we're calling it, ZTN-ish. If something has some zero trust-like qualities and we could work it into, uh, you know, meet our needs and kind of address some of these pain points, then, then we call that, uh, we'll, we'll just call that zero trust, even though it, it may technically not be. Um, to do that, we kind of been reducing everything to basics, uh, which has its limits, and I'll kind of uh, get into that uh, as we go forward. Uh, solve for each one of these basics as best you can. Uh, another hard one is you gotta find budget to solve for these things as they uh, come along because someone's got to pay for it. And most importantly is you've got to try to tie all these things together so that as you grab these bits and pieces of, uh, of uh, zero trust-ish things that are helping solve problems and work, we need them to still talk to each other and still seem as a cohesive unit. And that's kind of a difficult thing at times. So I got a list of basic needs here, and I'll just kind of go through some of these uh, uh, fairly quick, uh, just to give you an, uh, an idea. We need to have multi-factor authentication. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this. Apparently, the password is a security risk, so we had to add a second factor onto it. I, I don't know why they didn't just get rid of the password. It would have made a lot more sense, but no, we had to do a second factor. But anyway, multi-factor. We wanted to be able to do uh, user authentication with multi-factor. Uh, we wanted to get um, uh, the uh, provisioning and deprovisioning of uh, users down to minutes. I mean, we didn't like paying people to do nothing. Yeah, just, you know, instead of days, and I'm not exaggerating, when I first started, it was, it was, two to three weeks to get someone fully provisioned. And it was, I will admit this publicly, it's, it's a kind of a sad thing when you find, hey, here's an account for uh, on this system that has root access and their name is Andy. Who's Andy? <laughs> oh, Andy, oh yeah, he used to work here a couple years ago. Well, we probably should do something about that, okay? Who's responsible for this system and who can administrate it? Well, we just, let's see, who's got Andy's password? We'll look it up and see if we can. I mean, 
that's just, I, you know, you move forward. You're just, I mean, we're a company that's doing a, we don't, we do weird stuff like do a major release every month, literally. So, I mean, it's just like things happen fast and then this things fall to the wayside. We want to fix that. Uh, secure communications. And by that, I mean, we wanted to use HTTPS everywhere, which, uh, you know, internally as well as as uh, much as we could externally, but mainly internally, as these things are, systems are all talking to each other. Uh, we want to be able to audit these access controls. It's cool to have all these access controls. We want to be able to audit them, not just so, so that way we know what's going on and also we could actually do things like, you know, pass audits and stuff like that where they say, are you controlling access to your stuff? And, um, we want to be able to manage all our assets. We're doing, like I said, we got the whole instance container thing f fairly covered, but it'd be nice to be able to do it consistently and in a way that we can all gather it kind of in one central spot that kind of made sense. And we got to do something about all those laptops. And then really wanted to do uh, the tracking of uh, odd things that kind of just pop up on the radar. Uh, all of this stuff that we're talking about with zero trust, there's parts of it where all of a sudden something doesn't work or if something bad's happening or something's going haywire, something might pop up here or there uh, that's odd. We want to be able to track that and act upon it. Uh, it's a good source of... Uh, uh, detecting things going wrong. So some of the solutions we came up with. Uh, when I first started, this was, uh, they had just kind of looked at and we're starting to look at uh, Okta. And it, very soon after that, I think we, we started a pilot and then pretty much uh, rolled it out everywhere. This took care of uh, multi-factor. Uh, it took care of it quite well because it has multiple choices for doing multi-factor. Uh, it handled some GOIP type stuff. There's, uh, we do have some requirements that we wanted to eventually enforce uh, involving GOIP, at least being able to identify that a particular user is coming from a particular country. Uh, that would be kind of handy uh, to, to know, uh, simply because, like, let's say you wanted to uh, uh, sell something to one of these of fine uh, government institutes just down the street, they might say, well, we only want U.S. citizens working on this project for us uh, on U.S. soil. And so this is, you know, this is a reason. Uh, and I, I, it doesn't have to be exact, at least just show us what country they're in, okay? We need at least that much right there. And the better that we can get the GOIP, great. Um, it does allow us to do some type of restrictions on clients, like they have to meet at least some semblance of a standard, like, hey, we're not going to let you in, you're on Windows, you know, that, might, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't mean to disparage Windows for the Windows users here, but it kind of is a mess. There's probably other presentations at conferences about this whole thing. Uh, and then, of course, the provisioning and deprovisioning thing, that was wonderful. Uh, because we use uh, we use Bamboo HR, and so People Ops, when you get hired on, they create a new user in Bamboo HR. It's pushed up to Okta. Okta has API access to a whole ton of SaaS applications. It can instantly provision based upon what this person's role is in the company, and go through and provision in all these systems. So all of a sudden. New users created, and within a minute or two, they're provisioned in everything Okta can provision them in, which is most everything. So all of a sudden, instead of taking two to three weeks to provision a user, it now takes a couple of minutes. And that is a great, great time saver. You get a person more productive quicker. You're not trying to track down you know, Alice, because she has access to the whatever systems to create accounts, you know, and she's on vacation, or she's busy doing her job that you pay her, that you're supposed to be paying her to do, 
that kind of thing. So it, it really helps. Uh, we're also using uh, Okta for ASA is the name of the product. It, SSH, it does SSH and, uh, and I think it does uh, RDP as well, but we use it for the SSH. And it's not fully deployed yet. We got it for the, um, uh, the infrastructure team needed it. I think they were the ones that were saying, look, we've got a new project coming up. We're going to be hiring 40 people. I don't want to pull someone off to create 40, 40 accounts on a zillion systems. What can we do? They saw what Okta was bringing to the table, so we were able to put this in. So it's partially deployed. Pretty soon, all our coders are going to have to go through this process as well and that, uh, that have access to systems that require SSH. So that's cool. Uh, communications. This one's kind of weird. Uh, this is kind of a, a kind of a happy accident. We had a security problem on an internal system, and we fixed it. Uh, and they figured out, well, let, let's just use this camo proxy. It's going to fix it. As a side effect, it enforced uh, HTTPS. So someone got the bright idea. Says, hey, why don't we just deploy this everywhere? I was like, all right. Boom, problem solved. We got HTTPS everywhere because we're using camo proxy everywhere. So that's good. And to keep us from being uh, attacked by the evils of the world out there, partially, uh, uh, <laughs> preventing some of that stuff. But anyway, for DDoS and then uh, you know some of the, the, the WAF stuff that uh, CloudFront offers, we have that in place. Um, asset management. Uh, this is kind of, okay. This is kind of rough. All right, uh, Fleet Smith. We're using Fleet Smith. Uh, we went through a whole big trial of getting something in. I I wanted something that would work on Mac and Linux because we do allow Linux in there. Fleet Smith does not work on on Linux. We have about uh, I think at last numbers I looked at, I think we're about eight percent of our user population is, uh, is our Linux users. Um, so we have Fleet Smith. It's on this laptop right here. I don't know if it's going to stay. They're looking at some other stuff. Um, uh, Drive Strike is being evaluated because they want to be able to do some type of uh, endpoint remote wipe. You need that kind of ability on there. So it's currently in an eval process. I don't know if we're going to implement it or not. Uh, uh, my opinion on it uh, is I, I think Fleet Smith, if you paid a little bit more for it, you could get it to wipe. I'm not sure. I'm not responsible for it, but uh, since they're thinking about possibly replacing that, then this, they're looking at drive strike. I don't know. We've, we keep going back and forth and arguing about uh, OS query because we could do stuff with OS query for both Mac and Linux. And, uh, but we would probably have to do a lot of custom type stuff that, uh, to make it work with what we're doing. Uh, so we're still kind of up in the air on that. As far as security monitoring of some of the uh, assets we have internally, uh, uh, Tenable, IO, and uh, Uptics. Uh, I don't know what people's opinion are of Uptics. I've got kind of a love-hate. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, love-hate, just like... Eh, it could be good. It does some stuff good, but then there's other stuff like, hey, if I get an alert, I'd like to have, like, everything in the alert, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I just like, uh, there's people that swear by it, and I, I usually swear at it about as, about half, you know, so that's, I'm not, I'm not thrilled with it. It does kind of do roughly what we're wanting, but again, like, when you're trying to do things like be able to quickly manage something odd happening and, uh, uh, this is, it's not necessarily ideal for what we want. Um, a lot of, we move a lot of, you know, dealing with stuff with containers and stuff. We use Chef, uh, some knife, uh, Terraform, the HashiCorp stuff. We're, we're, we're doing, uh, doing that there. Um, so we think we got a pretty good handle on, on that. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, if you say, oh, he keeps saying we got a pretty good handle on it, uh, then what I ask you to do is, uh, Go set up an account on Hacker One and and uh, come after us, baby. That's what I say. <laughs> we'll pay you. We've been paying a lot of money out for bug fixes, so 
So that's cool. We're, we're cool with that. Um, logging, uh, uh, elastic, com combination of elastic, uh, elk. Uh, I think cabana is uh, going away. I, I, is it? You don't think so? Oh, all right. There may be some departments <laughs> still using it. I, we, I, I know that uh, for the security department, we were thinking uh, about uh, getting rid of it. But the secure department that you're in, completely different department, believe it or not. Not confusing at all. Uh, they're apparently using it. Uh, there was talk about uh, maybe r redoing some stuff. But uh, I don't know. See, it keeps going back and forth. See, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't read the latest memo. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Future. Where we're heading with this stuff that we're as we're looking forward, uh, we need better uh, asset management, and we're we're having problems with this. Uh, but uh, we're we need better asset management and user devices as well as containers and stuff. Um, we need to solve the BYOD problem, and there. This is something that's kind of weird. I'm thinking that it's possible that we could do BYOD. All right? And call me crazy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Someone's looking at me. Give me a look. But uh, I, I think it's theoretically possible if I could somehow convince someone to run something on their system that at least tells me that they're patched up and they're configured safe, safely, I may allow them access to some of the data internally. Maybe not red data, but some of it. I think I can live with uh, parts of that. And that would handle, uh, that would take care of the, I mean, good Lord, we're doing it with mobile phones, right? You know, I mean, I mean how many people here have two phones, one for themselves and one for work? A few people. Most people uh, don't do that. You know, they have one phone, and that's all they want. And they, you know, they get all religious about it. Oh, you're not putting something on my phone. I, I think if we can, you know, be open about it uh, with people, that we can convince them to uh, convince them to do it. Um, I already mentioned this before. I'm calling this non-people because we've been talking mainly about people, but things that aren't people, like processes and stuff like that, or you know, just anything to do with non-people, uh, you know, where we're, we're tracking a token, we're tracking, you know, s you know, a process, something like that, uh, we need to get a handle on that from an identity uh, perspective. I want to treat uh, these processes like they're people when it comes to doing that whole zero trust thing. And no vendor does that at all. So... That's going to be an ugly roll your own at best. So I'm not sure what we're going to do there. Uh, but that's something I'd like to do. And, of course, uh, uh, we're looking right now at another project I'm, that's just kind of getting off the ground I'm looking at is uh, uh, doing uh, machine language-assisted uh, uh, anomaly detection. I, you know, this is pseudo-based upon work I did at uh, MITRE where we would look at uh, trying to automate looking at uh, bad things that would happen in weird places. And you got to pull stuff from uh, different logging systems that don't seem to, you're just like, why would you pull something from this log and that log? Well, you know, it, it's kind of like um, uh, when uh, the advert, when you're like, you're on Facebook and someone says, okay, well, you know, he likes cats and his favorite color is blue, so there's a 40% chance he drives a Prius, so let's throw Prius ads at him, that kind of thing. Uh, it's, you know, it's kind of like that for uh, anomalies that occur on your network. If you find some, you know, four or five weird things that always seem to happen, and they're related, and you look into it, and it's always related to a, a, some type of security incident, then maybe I want to track those things. Pardon? Well, yeah, I am treating the Prius as an anomaly. I actually, I actually, uh, yeah. The fact that I drive one has nothing to do with that either. 
Um, and of course, I'd like to kill the password. I just thought I'd throw that in there because I haven't brought it up enough. You know, it just it could go away. Why not have your two-factor be something you have and something you are? See, someone says no. I got to come up with a solution that gets me away from the password. But anyway, I'm going to come up with something. I don't know. Well, we're going to come up with something. That's our job, right? We're security people. Got to do something about that password. Uh, advice. You're going to have to get upper management buy-in on this. It was uh, pretty easy for us. Uh, one of our CEO's biggest fears was that a, uh, an event would occur that would be the equivalent of a remote wipe. Uh, that was one of his fears. He says, that's a big fear of mine. doesn't matter if we can recover from backups. You just think about the hurt to your reputation. You think to the hurt to the, you know, just the recovery time that, you know, because you've got, you know, thousands of customers and things like that. You know, that's the thing that people worry about. So they say, okay, well, what are we going to do about this? This is why if you go out on the GitLab website and search for, uh, oh, by the way, we have pretty much our entire company is, wide open for you to look at. Uh, you can go out there and search and see what our data classification uh, stuff is. And it has in there, under red, it says, specifically it says, you know, company ending event. That's, you know, that's a, you know, a tied to, you know, the disclosure of red data. Uh, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a big, big deal. And so fortunately for us, upper management was in, uh, in uh, support of it. It does help to break things down into uh, uh, simple components. Uh, just to try to, like for us, like most of my focus has been on uh, user identity and things tied to users, so I've ended up doing things like, um, I'll get into that in a minute. I have a story to tell that's kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, look for areas of winning and capitalize on them. Okay, and this, what I mean by this is that provisioning thing that we did, where all of a sudden we go from, uh, you know, three weeks to uh, a couple of minutes, that bought us a lot of cred uh, with the company, with other departments, when we said, okay, look, if you're looking at a SaaS application that you're wanting to use, you have to make sure that it can talk to Okta, because otherwise you're going to have to have, you know, Bob go in there and he's going to be creating user accounts for people in the SaaS application because Bob's the owner of the application uh, from uh, our perspective. So why don't we, uh, why don't you just let, uh, let us handle that by, you know, creating the roles and, and, and whammo. We'll instantly get your thing done. And they, they'll do that. And so that way that becomes a part of our uh, zero trust model, so to speak because it's now tied into that. So you can do things like that. And of course, you know, you have to ignore the vendor spin. Uh, I've mentioned Okta a lot. We looked at a lot of pl different places. Uh, all the other ones that you can think of that are tied to uh, authentication and identity. And this one just happened to seem to work for us. It may not work for you. And they say all kinds of stuff about zero trust and everything and how they're such a great solution. They worked for us in one area, but that doesn't mean that uh, uh, it, we're not using every single one of their, uh, you know, goofy add-on products, you know, because we don't need them. And they, they mean nothing, and they're not going to help us. But we do use a, a, you know, part of what they offer. Um, I want to talk about company culture a little bit. Okay. Adoption of new ideas, this will work better if you get input from the users, okay? Uh, let me give you an example on the, on the uh, multi-factor thing. On multi-factor, we told people, we said, look, you're going to have to use multi-factor. Uh, and before, I think some of it was like just kind of a combination of, you know, whatever the app offered, you know, you know uh, usually SMS that kind of thing. Uh, or they could do a TOTP thing and have like, you know, uh, you know, Google Authenticator or whatever the hell it is on there. Uh, but what we did was we said, look, okay, 
we would prefer you use like uh, YubiKeys, do this U2F thing. If you want to expense a YubiKey, we gave some out at a big company get together where we had most of the company in uh, New Orleans. We were handing them out. Uh, we'll help, and you know, we were there to help set them up if they wanted to and all that. Uh, get them using YubiKeys. And some people says, well, I don't want to use a YubiKey. This doesn't make sense to me because if I plug it into my laptop and leave it in there and someone steals my laptop, they've got my my uh, credentials. Like, okay, you got a point. Okay, well, you could use, Okta has this app called Verify and you can load that on your phone and then you can do a push. So now you have a choice and that pretty much covered everybody. Everybody was either willing to use that app and get the push or they could use a YubiKey. Uh, and we allow both. And we allow either one. So if it's more convenient for them to uh, use the YubiKey at one location or use the app on another location, fine. We support and allow both of them. And that met, uh, that made sure that the users were actually doing it. And, it's be and they become used to it. Um, This is a kind of a, a, a weird one. You have to leave things better for end users than when you started, okay? If you make their life easier when you put in security solutions, then they're more willing to accept it. The best security solutions are the ones they either don't notice or they, uh, it's, become such a part of it that they don't even remember. It just becomes, uh, it becomes the same thing of like uh, when you uh, uh, get out of your car, you lock the door. It's, or you leave the house, you lock the door. It's just like this automatic thing that you do. You don't even think about it. It's like muscle memory. You know? And that's what you want to instill. You want to make the security part so easy. I don't expect the end users to be security experts. Yes, they're a part of the equation because we need everyone needs to work together to keep the company safe and all that. However, I'm not expecting someone that is an expert in selling product in sales to be also an expert in security. That's my job. My job is to make sure they're secure and get out of their way so they can sell the product and pay my salary and make those stocks worth something when we uh, IPO in November, okay? <laughs> that's what I want, okay? Uh, but, I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's just like we, don't, we shouldn't expect them to be uh, security experts at all. I mean, okay, I'm going to go back to that password thing. But, I mean, look what we did to them with the password thing. Oh, you got to change it every 90 days. Okay, you got to, you know, you got to do the... Uh, uh, you got to start doing upper and lower case. Oh, you got to make it longer than eight characters. Oh, you got to do this. And it's got to be really complex. And they're coming back to you saying, how come when I play Sudoku online, the password I can put in there is more complex than what I have to put in for my bank? You know? And you say, well, you know, sorry. And, and you just kind of continue on and say, this thing's a disaster. We're really sorry that the password thing didn't work out. And then you... After that, of course, they're going to have some ill feelings toward the security people because we keep giving them weird advice, you know, especially when we say, oh, yeah, we know the password. So, okay, just now you got to use this password manager thing and you got to use this little thing you plug into the side of your computer and, you know, press with your finger and all that. It, it, it just, they, they, they don't need that. We don't need that. Okay, just make things easier for them. Um, and basically, as far as we go, if a ex solution is extremely hard or extremely complex, then we probably should be doing something else, okay? Because if we're putting in something that's extremely uh, complex for us, uh, oh, my God, what if we get it wrong? What if something happens and uh, what if we need to explain something to someone or just say, no, you have to go through this extra step when you log in now that's weird, okay? Uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not good. And so my summary on that basically is 
Zero's Fresh solution should make things easier, and if it doesn't do that, find a better solution. So any solution that you're, where you're implementing, where you're involving, a, you know, you're getting a stuff from a vendor, you're getting stuff from uh, uh, that you're implementing yourselves. If it's not making things easier, then then don't do it. Okay. And that pretty much ends the talk proper. And thank you very much. We appreciate it. Uh, we do have time for questions. Probably no one has any questions whatsoever. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, remote, he asked, the question was, uh, mentioned remote wipe. Are we doing remote wipe on BYOD devices? No, we're not. Uh, it would be nice to be able to do a remote wipe of company data, uh, but we can't really, that's kind of a tough one to control. Okay, so uh, with some phone apps that support, uh, you know, there, there's ways to do like, I'll just wipe the company data off of that or it'll disappear then, so you can do some of that. Uh, there's a question over here who, Okay, you don't work for Microsoft. <laughs> All right, you're going to defend Microsoft. Okay, good. All right. All right, I do. Now you are you are talking about you, you, his comment was that there's a lot of things that Windows does Windows do, does right. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, we we are using Azure uh, for uh, bits and pieces of what we're doing. Uh, I was mainly talking about the desktop, and and uh, so there so there you go. Uh, one other one, and then we need to wrap it up. How much does multi-cloud make it harder? Uh, it uh, has forced us to get creative, okay? Uh, so if you standardize on a tool that you know works on multiple whatevers, let's say something that's uh, dealing with a, uh, an instance like, like Kubernetes, so dealing with Kubernetes, if I can know that I can move stuff around to whatever platform, uh, and have it say reasonably the same, then I'm, I'm, I'm usually, we're usually okay. We've done some stuff on it. There's actually been some blog posts on GitLab by some of the people who've had to implement things where they say, hey, we had to come up with this thing where we had to talk to three different cloud systems and push something out, and here's what we came up with. I mean, so we're, we're working through it. It's, it doesn't make it uh, easier, but it's one of those things where we have to keep that in mind. Uh, when doing it, like I said, most of what I've been, like I said, most of what I've been focusing on has been user centric, uh, and as we start getting the user part uh, handle on that, we're starting to move now towards uh, uh, getting the uh, the non person uh, things taken care of as well. So that's kind of uh, since we kind of roughly had a handle, it wasn't as blaringly bad as the user part was. Anyway, that's it. I'll be around if you have more questions. Thank you. <laughs>